One of the most interesting things about ancient and medieval history is no doubt the chronicles of royal dynasties, lines of family members who ruled powerful states. Popular culture seems to like the idea of one royal family ruling the known world, if you will. Although powerful royal dynasties outside of Africa tend to be more known, we haven't really explored in full the extraordinary legacies of powerful ruling family dynasties in Africa. Today, we're going to change that. What up, African world? It's Home Team here, and welcome back to another video of African history, culture, and worldview. Today, we're going to talk about the top 10 most powerful royal dynasties in Africa. And as always, if you want to support the home team, you can do so on Patreon.com. You'll have access to live streams where we discuss various topics, talk about sources, and much more. And I have some new awards for you guys. Also, go to Afrographics.com, a website where you can find unique illustrative infographics summarizing African history. And don't forget the home team merchandise where you can get shirts, hoodies, and crew necks. All links to Patreon, Afrographics, and Home Team merchandise are in the description box below. When it comes to certain regions in Africa, family dynasties, instead of advancing strict and absolute bloodline ties, have been seen to exhibit some fluidity. Thus, some of the dynasties on this list may consist of a ruler or rulers who merely adopted the royal family name instead of having an actual blood relation. Now, of course, there were many powerful royal dynasties all throughout Africa, but our list will consist of dynasties that express their power, not only amongst other African groups, but especially non-Africans as well. And that's the key. The qualification for the dynasties on this list is that the power of these royal families should be enforced directly or indirectly on a local and international level or a simple projection of power will count as well. So let's get right into it. Coming in at number 10, we have the Sise dynasty of the Wagadu Empire. The Sise dynasty were a ruling family of the Soninka people. The founder of this dynasty is the semi-mythical Dengue Sise who first settled the area and his sons founded the Wagadu state. Kaya Magen Sise in 700 CE being the first recognized ruler and founder of the Sise line. What makes the Sise dynasty unique is that they were the first West African royal family to wield dominion over Arab and Berber peoples of the Maghreb. The Sise dynasty dominated the wealth of that region and were able to wrest power away from the fragmented Berber clans. Upon the arrival of Arabs to that region, the Sise rulers ensured that the Arabs paid tribute to Wagadu. This business relationship apparently worked so well that the Sises even created another city specifically for Muslim travelers. Al-Bukhari himself, a prominent Muslim scholar from the 11th century, gives testament to the power of just one of the Sise dynasty kings, Tenkamenin. Ghana is a title the people give to their kings. The name of the region is Alkar, and their king today, namely in the year 460, is Tenkamenin. This Tenkamenin is powerful, rules an enormous kingdom, and possesses great authority. Next, at number 9, we have the Kilukeni dynasty, also known as the Kilukeni Kanda amongst the Isi Congo people, founded in 1380. The Kilukeni dynasty originated from the founder of the Congo Empire of the Isi Congo people, Lukeni Nimi. The founding father Lukeni conquered kingdoms in the south and made his capital at the mountain of Congo, also known as Mbanza Congo. It was from his line that the Kilukeni Kanda or dynasty began. Even though the Kilukeni royal family can be criticized for accommodating and relying too heavily on the goods and services of the Portuguese upon their arrival, the Kilukenis, despite this flaw, exhibited and maintain the power of Congo and especially the power of the Kilukeni line. The Kilukenis adopted Christianity under the rule of Nzinga Nkuu. Ironically, King Nkuu only converted because Congo was on the verge of civil war and he needed a new ally. This decision unfortunately got all the Kilukenis distracted in Portuguese interest. However, one of the most prominent Kilukenis, King Mvemba Nzinga, 
the son of Nzinga Nku, successfully resisted Portuguese efforts of total control and consolidated his power, keeping them at bay. Later, another Kiwukeni, King Diogo Mpudi, continued the chess game with the Portuguese and came out on top. In 1553, he won the right to appoint a captain of the Portuguese against the rights of the Portuguese throne itself. How he managed to do this was very impressive. This magnificent political power move was one of the first times in African history an African king had some semblance of power and influence over a European throne. At number 8, we have the Moorish dynasty of the Almoravid Empire in 1042. The Amoravids primarily originated amongst the Lamtuna Berber ethnic group who inhabited the region of the Dra River to the Senegal River. The Sanhaja Berbers had formed a loose confederation consisting of the Lamtuna, Musufa, and Gudala in order to control the Saharan trade route that was dominated by the Sisei dynasty. The overlordship of the Sisei soon provoked these various Berber clans to finally unite under Islam. Various Berber leaders began to rally tribes together to form the Amoravid movement. Abdullah Aben Yasin and his followers, known as the Amoravids, undertook a jihad and began to advance the Amoravid movement gaining much territory. Abdullah Aben Yasin was unfortunately killed in battle, but his bloodline continued the Amoravid dynasty. Upon his death, his brother Abu Bukhari Abin Umar took the Moors throne and under his rule, the Amoravid movement became a powerful empire. The Amoravid dynasty rallied the Africans from Tekrur in Senegal along with some Berber groups to form the foundation of their power. And of course you can't have a proper royal family dynasty without dramatic family beefs. Yusuf Abin Tashfin, the cousin of Abu Bukhari, pretty much g-checked his cousin by not getting off his horse to greet him, taking full control of the Amoravids. Some would even say that he took his cousin's wife as well, but it seems as though it was actually a mutual agreement. Nonetheless, under the rule of Yusuf, the Amoravids were taken to the next level and conquered southern Spain, creating a royal African line having control over parts of Europe. This no doubt cemented the power of the Moorish dynasty in Western Africa and abroad. For number 7, we have the Safuwa dynasty of the Kanem-Bornu Empire. The Safuwa dynasty were a ruling family of the Kanembu people originating amongst King Humay in 1075. Even though technically one can make the argument that the Safuwa shouldn't be on the list because they didn't necessarily hold any sway or dominion over a non-African group. However, they did dominate Saharan trade which impacted Arab economic control over parts of the Sahara. One of the powerhouses of the Safuwa royal line is King Idris Aluma who greatly advanced the Kanembrunu Empire. There can be two things that are said to be unique amongst the Safuwa royal family. First, this dynasty was one of the longest lasting dynasties not only in Africa but the world. And second, the Safuwa advanced their power specifically by taking full advantage of the resources around them, not just the resources in Africa, but the resources around the world. William Reed sums up the journey of Captain Clapperton and his two colleagues to the Kanembrunu Empire under the Safuwa dynasty. He states that in their visit to Kanembrunu around the 19th century, they were astonished to find among the Negroes magnificent courts, regiments of cavalry, the horses caparisoned in silk for gala days and clad in coats of mail for war, long trains of camels laden with salt and natron and corn and cloth and cowrie shells, which form the currency, and kola nuts, which Arabs call the coffee of the Negroes. They attended with wonder the gigantic fairs at which the cotton goods of Manchester, the red cloth of Saxony, double-barreled guns, razors, tea and sugar, Nuremberg ware, and writing paper were exhibited for sale. They also found merchants who offered to cast their bills upon houses at Tripoli, and scholars acquainted with Avicenna, Averroes, and the Greek philosophers. The Safuwa royal line, especially under Idris Aluma, were no doubt a powerhouse in Central Africa, creating one of the most progressive and advanced medieval African empires on the continent. 
Coming in at number 6, we have the Royal Barca family. The Barca family was a noble Carthaginian family of Carthage originating around 247 BC. Now technically, they weren't rulers of Carthage in totality in the traditional sense, but we have to give them credit for essentially driving the direction of Carthaginian politics and statehood. Some may be surprised that the Barca family is so high on the list, but it was a relatively short-lived dynastic rule. The surname Barca apparently means thunderbolt, and it most certainly is a fitting name for this family as their rule jolted the known world at the time. The origin of the Barca dynasty and legacy begins with Hamako Barca, the father of Hannibal. In 238 BC, General Hamakar Barca led an expedition into Spain. This expedition was unauthorized by the Carthaginian government, but Hamakar Barca was very ambitious. The Barca family's control of Spain ensured their power in Carthage. After Hamilcar conquered parts of Spain, he was able to amass great wealth from plunder, filling his public treasury. This wealth bought him a proper army and helped him to purchase majority support from the Carthaginian Senate, and thus began the extraordinary power of the Barca royal line. Hannibal Barca continued the legacy of his father and carried the Barca family by being Rome's greatest rival. With his brother's support, the Barca family under Hannibal dominated Carthage, showed the world the power of the Barca line, and shook Rome to its very core. Breaking our top 5, we have the Shangamire dynasty of the Razvi Empire. The Shangamire dynasty originated amongst the Shona people of the Razvi Empire in southern Africa. The Shangamire royal line rose in about the year 1660 under their founding father, Shangamire Dumbo. The Shangamires were the greatest power in southern Africa in the 17th and 18th centuries. With the decline of the Mwene Mutapa Empire as a regional power, and with the increase in civil unrest, elite Shona countrymen of wealth developed their own armies. The greatest of these armies were the Razvi, also known as the Destroyers, led by their leader Shangamire Dumbo. Shangamire earned the title of Great Lord, and by the 1670s, he formed an empire that became a major force in the Northeast Zimbabwe Plateau. It was the brilliance of the early Shangamire dynastic line that began to totally obliterate Portuguese influence and meddling in the region. The Portuguese were absolutely humiliated by the Shangamire dynasty as they militarily dominated the region. It's even rumored that the bullhorn formation popularized by Shaka Zulu was in fact started or at least used earlier by the Shangamires. This dynastic line prompted the Portuguese to wave the white flag and leave the plateau altogether. The military power and domination earned the submission and respect of all the Africans in the region and especially the Portuguese. This was a rare occurrence in Africa. For an African dynasty to force a European nation to leave altogether is certainly testament to the power of the Shangamire royal family. Next at number 4, we have the Kushite dynasty or more popularly known as the 25th dynasty of Egypt. The Kushites acquired their independence from Egypt and began to become a serious threat. The Egyptians shared a similar religion and culture to Kush and thus many of the Kushites felt that the Egyptians were becoming entirely too corrupt and lost their way. Thus, the founder of the Kushite dynasty, King Pai, went up into Egypt and conquered it in 744 BC. The founding of the Kushite royal line is literally written in stone on King Pai's victory cellar as his sons went on to rule the new Kushite empire. This glorious feat is often pinned as the African Renaissance as the Kushite royal line all rejuvenated and advanced now valley civilization. Later, King Pai's son, King Saharka, went on to put the Kushite dynasty on the global stage as his fame and his feats were romanticized by ancient Greek and Jewish accounts. The Kushite royal line is very unique in African history because all the kings from this dynasty had the same exact goal as their founding father, King Pai and they all purposely continued his legacy. They all restored and rebuilt Egypt and Kush, honoring each other one after the other with their religious vigor. 
The only reason why we can't put the Kushite dynasty into the top 3 is because it was short lived and they were only able to keep the Assyrians at bay for only a brief time, limiting them to just a projection of power. But the Kushite king certainly had a great impact on African history and left a lasting impression on the world stage. Coming in at number 3, we have the Kita dynasty of the Mali Empire. The Kita dynasty is certainly one of the most popular African dynasties originating amongst Sanjata Kita of the Mandinka people in 1235. After the fall of the Sise dynasty of Wagadu, various families were attempting to acquire power and fill the void left over by the Sises. The Kitas were up for the task as their founding father Sanjata Kita defeated Sumanguru Kante at the Battle of Karina. This epic battle led the Kitas to formulate one of the most unique things done in African history as they formed the only documented constitution in West Africa, solidifying their power. Shunjata Kita ensured that the Kita name would rule Mali generations to come by stating in the constitution found in Article 8 that the Kita family is nominated reigning family upon the empire. This was no doubt a power move for the Kitas as they went on to rule Mali. The most unique thing about the Kita line is that it seemed to be bigger than blood. The Kita name became something you can put on and wear if you will. The name became a sort of divine proclamation. Ironically, Sanjata Kita passed on the Kita name to a slave that he freed and this slave later became the king of Mali. His name was Manza Sakura Kita. Although he was not a blood Kita, he took on the name and carried the Kita legacy. Manza Sakura went on to grow the Mali Empire greatly, making it the primary power in the western Sudan. After his death, a blood Kita took the throne. But arguably the most powerful of all the Kitas was Manza Musa Kita as his wealth was unmatched. We hear about how he brought so much gold into Egypt that it affected the economy for decades. The Kitas went on to defeat a small invasion by the Portuguese on the coast and they advanced one of the most powerful cities in the medieval world, Timbuktu. The Kita royal line arguably built the most powerful African empire in West Africa. For number 2, we have 18th Dynasty Egypt. The 18th Dynasty began in 1580 BC with Pharaoh Amos. Pharaoh Amos was one of the most valuable pharaohs in all of Egyptian history because he's the one that completed the expulsion of the Asiatic invaders of northern Egypt. The first invasion of Egypt under the High Soaks had controlled the region for quite some time. He restored Egyptian rule in all of Egypt and because of him, Egypt entered into its most glorious phase, the New Kingdom. The royal family line of the 18th dynasty produced some of the most popular rulers in Egyptian history and arguably some of the greatest. This royal family is unique because it's the only dynastic line on our list that produced a female ruler, Queen Hatshepsut, her reign being one of the most successful in all of Egyptian history. Tutmos III, the son of an earlier 18th dynasty ruler, went on to turn Egypt into the largest empire anyone in that region had ever seen. Under Tutmos III, Egypt had dominion over various Asiatic tribes in the north and Egyptian power and influence continued to spread. The 18th dynasty pharaohs not only had a lot of power, but this royal family line had fame that lasted through the ages. Some of the most popular being Pharaoh Akhenaten and Pharaoh Tutankhamun. Even the spouses of the 18th dynastic family acquired power, wealth and esteem, rulers such as Queen Tai and Queen Nefertiti. The grand legacy of the 18th dynasty royal family cannot be denied. And finally coming in at number 1, we have the legendary Solomonic dynastic family of the Tigray and Amhara people of Eritrea and Ethiopia. One of the primary reasons why the Solomonic dynasty is the most powerful in Africa is because of its longevity. Some claim that the dynasty goes back all the way to the 10th century and lasting all the way to the 20th century. The Solomonic dynasty can be said to be mysterious and legendary at the same time as they claim direct descent from the Queen of Sheba, also known as Queen Makeda and King Solomon. 
The Aksumites, under the proposed Solomonic line, had spread the empire into Yemen, extending their power and influence. A new Solomonic line began with Yakuna Amlak of the Amhara with the founding of the Abyssinian Empire. From then on, all the Amhara kings began to profess to be direct descendants of the biblical King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. The Solomonic dynasty had dominion over Ethiopian history for centuries, and their longevity and power arguably had not been matched by any other African state. Under King Menelik II, Ethiopia maintained the reign of the royal line as they thwarted attempts at European colonization. This shining moment in Africa's history is a crowning achievement of this royal Ethiopian dynasty as no other African dynasty or line of rulers could stem the tide of European dominance. The Solomonic line will forever be an exemplary example of African dynastic excellence. Well, I'm all out guys. Be sure to support the home team on Patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace. Hey, hey.